Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, April 24th, 2014, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week I think you're going to find uh, I really mean it. We've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to give it a little jacked up, he tried to say, on some Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew did not compensate me for this endorsement, but I'm working on it. And uh, we hadn't shorted Monster in a while, so uh, maybe they'll uh, be willing to sponsor the show. All good stuff. All right. Enough of that nonsense. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. That's really all you need to know when it comes to the disclaimer. Hey, do me a favor. Throw me a bone. Sometimes there's more people here than there are reviews on Amazon, so somebody's holding out on me. If you read the book, you like the book, then put me up a review on Amazon. You can use that little tiny arrow there, or just go to Amazon.com and look up uh, the book. All right, what we talk about? Well, I want to talk a little bit more about transitions and that's why I have the transitions redux in here. What I like to do, as you may know, if you've been to these shows before, is I'll cover a topic and then I would like to come back to it, revisit it a little bit, especially if it's still relevant, and uh, close the loop on a few uh, on a few things. So I want to talk about hopefully how to make a smooth transition, if necessary, and that's going to make a lot more sense in a few minutes. Um, one thing you need to look at is, is it a stock market or is it a market of stocks? And for the most part, it's really a market of stocks, especially lately. And it's very important to look at what's going on under the surface. And I'm going to take a little time today to do that. And I think it's going to make a lot of sense. Um, I want to talk a little bit about moving average, proper order, very basic, TA 101. But not everybody starts with all this knowledge. So I uh, want to just take a second to show you that. Um, I want to back up my feel for the market with some stats. I don't want to label myself as being bearish, but I've been a little concerned if you got to put a label on me about the market. And I want to show you why, but then I want to back that up with a few stats, and I'm going to show you that in a, a few minutes. So rather than tell you what I'm going to tell you, let's just jump right into it. Um, for those of you who are familiar with my bow ties, uh, if you're not, join my YouTube channel. In fact, join my YouTube channel anyway. And I don't think you get spammed or anything from YouTube. I certainly won't send you any extra emails from that. And if you go in and look, you'll see my different videos. And my latest one is on bow ties. I also publish the market in a minute there, too. And you can always go to www.market in a minute. Dot com, but I digress. Anyway, so join the YouTube channel. Uh, check out the video on bow ties if you haven't already done so. Uh, uptrend proper order means that the 10-day simple moving average, and a simple moving average, obviously, is just the last 10 days of the price, the last 10 closes of the price divided by 10. And I know some of you guys, have, your eyes are glazing over. Uh, just bear with me. This will only take a second. The exponential moving average, front rates, front weights, the current data. So if price is doing this and you have a simple moving average, it just takes the last 10 prices, in this case, and divides by 10. The EMA will front weight the data, this data here, more than it does this. And it tends to catch up with prices faster. And that's kind of a cool anomaly. In fact, let me just show you one thing. And I learned this from my buddy Greg Morris. If you have a market in an exponential moving average, and the market drops through it, that moving average will turn really quick. In fact, it, it depends on the length of the moving average, I think, but usually uh, within a day or so, this moving average will turn. So that's something that I never really thought about, but um, Greg pointed out to me. So that's kind of a cool thing to just kind of file away when it comes to exponential moving averages. So you want your 10 greater than 20 and a 20 greater than 30. That's what I call uptrend proper order. That means the market is trending. Will it continue to trend? I don't know. But it means that the market is in a trend as defined by that metric. Downtrend proper order means that 10 is less than 20 and 20 is less than the 30. Now let's take a look at what that looks like. Now keep in mind, 
all, and watch the YouTube video because I talk about this too, but all indicators have lag. I much prefer to view an indicator as an illustrator. In fact, I only use occasional moving averages, and usually it's just these three. But I much prefer to use an indicator as an illustrator to tell me what's going on in price or show me as opposed to indicate what price will do. Okay, So it's all in hindsight, but if your 10 is greater than 20 and your 20 is greater than 30, then these moving averages are in uptrend proper order. Okay, The shorter period is above the longer period, and the longer period is above the even longer period when it comes to moving averages. And the downtrend, it's going to be just the opposite. By the way, this is uh, energy from a couple days ago. And this is biotech. As we can see, biotech is at a downtrend. Well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see. We could just draw a big arrow, a big blue arrow. In this case, it's uh, it's red. But in this case, the 10, which is this blue line here, is less than the 20. And the 20, which is this red line here, is less than the 30. Okay? And you might want to watch a YouTube video because even uh, – those of you who have been around for a while and understand bow ties and even trade bow ties and have used these moving averages quite frequently, there's a couple things um, in there that you might find interesting, like why I chose these particular moving averages. And I get asked those type of questions a lot. So let's do a little what I call empirical research. And if you read my column from a couple days ago, empirical research is a fancy way of saying looking at charts. Okay. Now, bear, bear with me for a second. Let me make a tradable universe. I'm going to look at all stocks, and then I'm going to sort all stocks by 250K or more volume. And that's a pretty good number. That's a, Especially if you're a private trader, you could trade stocks that are around 250,000 shares on average volume or more, obviously. So let me unflag everything in the system. And I'm going to flag all above the current symbol. And I'm copy those over to what I call my tradable universe. Now I look at almost all of these stocks every day. I say almost all of them because when I get towards the bottom, the low volatility stocks, I really don't give a um, I give a hoot too much about those stocks. And I, there's a few other ways I massage the data. I do look at the new highs, so if something that's lower in volatility is making new highs, at least I'll see it. And that's that's part of my empirical research. In fact, if we go over to that list, and you'll see that if I sort those by new highs, I don't want to digress too far, but this is part of my nightly analysis. Oops, let's see. Let's do price. Okay. So if we sort them by the price as a percent of new highs, there's a couple things in here that that um, that don't make a lot of sense. Maybe some buyouts and things like that. But one thing you'll notice is what's towards the top of this list is utility. Okay. And that's part of those defensive stocks I've been talking about lately, okay? What else is in here? Well, you got a bond fund, okay? Second one or third one on the list is the bond fund. Well, that's not really tradable, but that tells you, okay, well, wait a minute. Some of the highest um, or the stocks that are in the, at the highest levels now are bond funds, short-term bond funds, that is. And then this is a commodity fund, okay? An agricultural fund. And then uh, CCK, that's a non-durable. That can be sort of seen as a defensive type of issue. Uh, but then you got another utility. Then you got a bond fund. And you got a couple things in here, like um, Verizon. That looks like a buyout. Then you got a buy fund. Sorry, a bond fund. And then consumer staples. Now, consumer staples, that could be considered what? A defensive stock, right? Um, I don't know what this company does, but that's one that's a bit of an aberration in these. And then you got another bond fund, and then you kind of see what's going on here. And then you got a couple of these, uh, a few more bond funds, and then you got a couple of ETFs. Just kind of at quick glance, there's an oil fund, okay? 
uh, XOP oil and gas expiration at all time highs, or brand new 52 week highs at least in this particular case. Okay. Uh, there's an energy fund. There's a bond fund. I'm sorry, there's an energy company. There's a bond fund. So you get the idea, right? Here's another energy company. Here's another energy company. Here's another bond fund. Okay. So just by looking at the new highs in this list, what is that telling me? It's telling me that most of the stocks that are making new highs or what? Well, PPL, that's a elect that's an electricity company, right? That's a utility. They're defensive. Most of the companies in here are defensive in nature. Uh, maybe commodity related, okay? A few commodity related. And I'm going to flesh this out in, in a lot more detail in just one second. But you kind of get the idea. And there's Alcoa, aluminum. So there's a commodity. So we got a commodity or two in here. We got a bunch of bond funds, which means that uh, people are kind of uh, putting money into bond funds, short-term bond funds, maybe because they they're they're nervous about stocks. Okay, so that's telling you what they they're putting money in defensive stocks and or commodity stocks because these stocks can trade contra to the other to the um, to the overall market and to the other stocks. So that's kind of like a that's the way that people are voting based on these new highs. Now, after I look at those new highs, uh, the other thing I like to do is, and I'm just get, kind of giving you a, a brief little snapshot of uh, my nightly analysis. Now, these stocks that are way up here are going to be very volatile. They're not going to be that meaningful. So I'm going to get through these real quick. In fact, let's just drop down to when we get to about 100 or so in volatility. Now, what is this stock doing? And it may take the screen a second to catch up. This stock is in what? I would say a downtrend, okay? This stock's kind of going down, 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 okay? Now, I'm going to go pretty quick through these. And if you get the recording, you'll actually see it. But as I'm going through these stocks, that one was kind of going up, but that's one out of many. And you can see more and more and more of these stocks are dropping like a stone, okay? That one's going down, another one. So what is my empirical research telling me by looking at these stocks? There was one little utility about three back that was actually in an uptrend. But by looking at these stocks, what is it telling me? Well, it looks like to me... Now, there's an aberration there. There's one that's headed higher. But for the most part, lower, lower, lower. These stocks are headed where? They're headed down, okay, in price. So just come in here and look at stocks and look at a lot of stocks. Oh, well, there's one an uptrend. Now we're back to downtrends. There's an uptrend. But just come in here and look at a lot of stocks, and you're going to see that the vast majority of them are in downtrend. So this is my empirical research, okay? And then the other thing I pay attention to is what sectors are these in? Well, a lot of technology-related stocks, software, biotech, et cetera. Now, we're going to get to all this. I'm going to come back to the market in just a few minutes. I just want to show you what comes up when you're doing this empirical research by looking at a lot of stocks or this observational research. I, I know right now, just by looking through these charts, that it looks like most of the stocks are going lower. Now, we can quantify that in a variety of ways, but one thing that I found interesting, if you take a look at the S&P 500, as you know, we're just shy of what all-time highs. In fact, if we could hang out about where we are today, up about a quarter of a percent, we're just about half a percent and change away from all-time highs. So... We just looked at a whole bunch of stocks, 100 or so stocks, and most of those stocks were in downtrends. Take my word on it. Unless you're watching the recording, you won't see it because the bandwidth can't keep up. But just take my word. Most were in downtrends. And here we have, but here we have the S&P just shy of all-time highs. Now, as a trend follower, I'm not going to fight all-time highs, but it is interesting that what's going on under the surface is a little bit different than what's actually going on on the surface here. Now the NASDAQ is looking a little rough in here. You can see it's made a, a, a thrust down and it's pulled back a little bit. Okay, we take the chart out, that becomes a little bit more obvious. You can see a thrust down to pull back and we'll flesh this out in a minute. But the point I'm trying to make here is that the S&P is kind of hanging in there in spite of the fact that many stocks weren't doing that well. Now, I thought it'd be kind of fun if we went to the S&P 500, and if you get a chance, read my column from a couple days ago, 
and I talked about this. I called it uh, What's Propping Up the Peas was the name of the column. And all you need to do is just go right here and look for, it was yesterday's column, right here, Wednesday's column. And if you haven't read it, um, oops, wrong one. Well, April 16th? No, no, no. Oh, here we go, 23rd. Sorry. Anyway, there's a calendar here, so you can go and says, what's propping up the piece? Okay. So this is the research. I'm going to show you how I did that research right now. And so we know that most stocks are headed lower. But what if we looked at the S&P 500 itself, which appears to be headed higher or certainly hanging in there? So if I sort these by uptrend proper order, which we just talked about a few minutes ago, okay, and let's see how many of these are in uptrend proper order. Let's go all the way to right here, okay? Well, you've got 176 out of 500 stocks that are in uptrend proper order. So that's about 35% or round numbers. Let's just call it a third. So only one-third of the stocks at the S&P 500 are actually in uptrends based on that metric, okay? And that metric, again, is that the moving averages, the 10 is greater than the 20, and the 20 is greater than 30, 20 EMA, 30 EMA, and 10 simple, okay? So based on this metric, only one-third of the stocks in the S&P itself or in uptrends, 70% based on this metric, or not. So that in and of itself should tell you that something is going on with the market. Now, if you take that one step further, so only one-third of the stocks, again, are trending based on that metric. If you take that one step further and dig a little deeper, Let's see the makeup of these stocks. And what's interesting is, okay, the vast majority of these are energies, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Okay, you get the idea, okay? And it goes on and on and on for quite a while. So you got energy after energy after energy or in here. You got a few financial services, but that could be uh, bond funds and things like that. Now, notice that when you get to food and beverage, look how many food and beverages you have in here. Okay, a couple of health services. I wouldn't get too excited about that because health services can trade contra to the overall market. But for the most part, you got a couple of commodity related area stocks in here. You got a whole bunch of defensive related stocks. And then you've got a few REITs that are making up this list. Okay. A couple of tobaccos, and that brings you back to what? Defensive stocks. And then a whole bunch of utilities. Okay. Now, there are a few stocks that are in a few other areas out there that I kind of just whiz by. But for the most part, we have what? Energies, utilities, and foods. So what's driving this market? What's propping up the peace? And the answer is defensive-related issues and REITs and a few commodity-related issues. So uh, can, those mark, can we have a bull market based on those few issues? And my, my answer is I don't think so, okay? So if you go in and watch yesterday's column, or watch, read yesterday's column, I should say, I have all the stats in here based on what I'm seeing empirically, okay? Uh, there were 29 in energies. There were eight consumer non-durables. So, the, again, the majority of the stocks in this list of that, now it's only 35% of this 36% that I have in here, is, or are, I should say, related to uh, defensive related stocks. So this market is rallying based on defensive issues, okay? So, and um, after I updated my data, looks like it went down a little bit. I said 35% when I did this uh, research earlier this morning, it was at 37%. So 35% of stocks in the S&P are in uptrend proper order. And again, those are energies, utilities, there's a few tobaccos, but they're mostly defensive type of issues 
there's some commodities in there which could trade contra to the to the overall market. And what's also kind of interesting, if you look at those commodity-related stocks outside of energies, some of those commodities could be seen as energy-related commodities, okay? And uh, then there's some REITs in there. And there's not too much excitement to get excited about with REITs, although we might find ourselves trading some, some of the more volatile ones, which volatility is relative in REITs because they're really not that volatile. And they don't move around a lot. Uh, the, the, you see people going to REITs. They might be looking for some sort of hard assets. When you see that move towards hard assets, you have to wonder if that's a move out of stocks. In, in 2000, right as the bubble burst, I was at a cocktail party. A doctor came up to me, and he knows what I do. And he says, uh, he goes, oh, I'm done with stocks. I'm going into real estate now. And then he did quite well for a while, and then that bubble burst. And I tried to explain to him the way bubbles work, but the, the best um, – what am I trying to say? Experience is the best teacher. How's that? <laughs> so, but I digress. So, but that's my way of saying that people tend to go towards these hard assets when stock market gets questionable. So, the point I'm trying to make is there's just not much to build a bull market on if you're looking at those P's and say, well, we're just off all time high, so that's a great thing. But you need to dig a little deeper and you need to see what's actually driving the market, okay? Now, you say, okay, well, 37 or 35% are an uptrend proper order. What percentage are a downtrend proper order? And when I ran the scan earlier this morning, 43% were in downtrend proper order. And that's a pretty big number. In fact, we have time. We're a little ahead of schedule. Let's, um, just for S&Gs, let's see if that 43% has gotten any bigger. So let's sort these by, and if any of you guys want these PCFs, there's nothing I do that I, that, I, that I hide. I mean, I have a couple of new things I'm working on I hadn't made public yet. But anything I come out and talk about, there's a few things in stock selection webinar I had made fully public, but uh, anything like this that I come out and talk about, if you want my scans, just ask me. I'll give them to you. I don't, I don't, there's nothing um, proprietary or anything. So let's take a look at the downtrend proper order, and let's see how many are true. Okay. So we have 221. So 44%. Okay. Was that number bigger or smaller? I forget. Let's see. I had 43%. Ah, so it's a little bit bigger. So now we're up to 44%. That's a pretty big number if you think about it. We're coming up on half of all stocks are in downtrends, almost. And only a third of all stocks are in uptrends. But the market is where? It's just off all-time highs. Now, one thing that kind of scares me is, and when we get to the energies, we'll look at them in a little bit more detail. But one thing that sort of scares me is the energies haven't corrected in a while, and neither have some of these other defensive stocks out there. And especially the energies because they're a lot more volatile than some of these other areas such as utilities and the foods. They're going to correct. I guarantee you that. I was talking to my peeps last night in the service. And it just seems like whenever you are you see a market that's just kind of going up in a route day after day after day after day, um, and it seems like it's never going to correct, that's usually a time right when it does. So I'll get emails when the market's in a rip roaring uptrend. Dave, what if this market never corrects? Or, Dave, it's so strong, I'm, uh, it's only correcting on 60-minute charts, so I'm, I'm trading hourly charts because it's too hard to get in on a daily chart because it just goes straight up. Well, usually the next day you, you have a pretty serious correction. Now, the reason I'm not getting those emails is because it's only a few select areas that are in those serious trends. Okay, And when we get to the market in a few minutes, we'll get to that. Any questions or anything so far? Now, are we at a possible transitional phase? I think so. Based on the NASDAQ action, based on the action in the Russell 2000, based on the action in the average stock out there. Now, this might have just been the mother of all corrections, and we might go on to make new highs, and that's fine with me. So there's a few cases that could happen, okay? Uh, assuming that we do roll over, meaning that we make a transition from this uh, long long uptrend that we've been in for so long 
what's going to happen? Well, hopefully our longs will stop out at modest gains, and hopefully some new and existing shorts will pick up the slack. And this is the portfolio ebb and flow that I talk about quite a bit. I'm not going to beat the dead horse too much this week, but I will bring up the portfolio in a few minutes and show you how that ebb and flow is shaken out so far. I think it's going to be really fun to watch how it uh, transpires given the uh, quickly changing market conditions. Now let's assume the market goes straight back up. Um, the question is, will the short stop out at modest losses or even possibly a small gain, depending on does the market dip before it goes straight back up, if it does. And the next question is, will the longs, both new and existing, pick up the slack? And sometimes if you do things properly and you're following this money management, it's kind of beautiful. The market begins to roll over. You start getting stopped out of your longs. All of a sudden, the shorts start triggering. You start making money on your shorts. And then you end up at a few longs that can trade contra to the overall market. And it's just a beautiful thing. And it's a nice, smooth flow. Okay, I can't guarantee that it will always happen that way, but sometimes it's really a beautiful thing. Now, the other thing could happen is we could enter into a choppy phase, okay? So we're, either the market's going to roll over, the market's going to turn back up, or, God forbid, we get into a sideways market, okay? I'm going to get to that in one second, Howard. That's bad advice, okay? That's really bad advice, okay? Now, so... If we do end up a choppy market, what will happen? We'll end up flat, okay? So the question is, will something emerge to sort of help us out? And maybe some commodities might come along, maybe some IPOs, some speculative type of issues that could trade contra to the overall market. And even if the market does go choppy, we'll have a few positions that will still work. So hopefully between all this, all this happening, we could end up with a smooth transition. So will it be a smooth transition? Again, like I said last week, I don't know. We'll know when we see it. We, you can only see so far out when it comes to markets. Okay, It's like one time I did a, a column not too long ago about don't out drive your headlights. It's like you can only see so far with your headlights. Okay, uh, You have to take things on a setup-by-setup -setup basis. If you really like a setup, whether it's a long or a short, if you really, really like it, and you can't and, and you look and you look at the sector and there's nothing better than that one stock and you just love it and you think it has potential, then take it. Okay? Forget about the sector, forget about the overall market. If you find a setup somewhat mediocre, then by all means make sure you you uh, double check with the sector and double check with the stocks within the sector to make sure that everything is confirming what you're seeing and then go for it. Okay. But for the most part, you really, really want to like it. And the other thing is use liberal entries and liberal stops. By that, I mean judge the volatility of the market. Make sure your entry is high enough for a long or low enough, low enough for a short that you don't get triggered in. I almost said stopped in because sometimes I use stops to enter positions. But you don't get triggered in on noise alone. And then by liberal stop, just make sure your stop reflects the at least the shorter term volatility of the market. And again, you want to let that portfolio ebb and flow work its way through your portfolio to where you get stopped out of some positions and then some new positions starts come, coming in. And again, like I said last week, it's okay to get flat if that's what begins to happen. Okay, A return of capital is sometimes more important than a return on capital. People get a little too caught up. They put a little pressure on themselves to, to try to make money as fast as they can. I do the same thing. I want to make money as fast as I can. But it puts a lot of pressure on you, and it forces you to sometimes try to make something happen. As my buddy Peter Marthy says, don't invent trades, okay? Um, so take that pressure off of yourself. Take the other pressure off of yourself by taking things on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, easier said than done, but go with the flow, okay? If you start getting stopped out of your longs and some shorts start triggering, then you kind of like, uh, like water, you have 
flowed with the market, okay, getting into that Eastern philosophy there. And it's kind of hard to be that antiseptic and, and take a step back. I know. I watch – even while I'm doing these presentations, I watch a screen. I just, it's just in me. It's, it's what I do. Uh, but I've learned over the years not to act as much and let things shake out. Um, Howard says, sounds like selling May and go fishing. No. Selling May and go away is bad advice, okay, because – as a general statement, yes, markets are choppy in the summer, but sometimes you have some phenomenal trends that can occur during the summer. Sometimes you have some selected issues that take off and might make your entire issue during the summer. For the most part, yeah, there's quite a few summers I wish I would have missed entirely, but I've seen some really good trades come out of the doldrums of the middle of the summer. So you need to continue to do your homework. Now, if you don't want or don't care to do your homework, obviously I am here and I will do that for you, okay? It's going to cost you a little bit, but I'll be happy to do that for you. And that's how a lot of my clients use me. They, they, they do their own homework for the most part, but they use me to pick up the slack when they can't or don't care to do the analysis. And that's especially true in the summertime, okay? But, yeah, sell in May and go away. Be careful with any of those kind of adages. Seasonality, by the way, does not work. You do not have a representative sample when it comes to seasonality, okay? Uh, so any, any of those type of adages or whatever you want to call them that are seasonality related are just bad. Just don't use it, okay? Um, you can take my word for it. I'm, I'm, like I said, um, I'm reading Greg Morris's book. Greg's a good guy, um, uh, one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. And let's see, I can show you. It's, it's on my website. And he, he takes things one step further than I take them, whereas in layman's, which you can get right here if you don't have it, and shame on you if you don't have it because, come on, you need it. Uh, but in layman's, I state things as kind of a, as a – I state them as a matter of fact, whereas Greg states them more as fact based by statistics. Okay, I just tell you that don't that seasonality doesn't work. Don't use seasonality, and I just I'll show you in the charts that the market doesn't always go up, and that Greg has taken that one step further to build a pretty serious case in the first half of his book on how a lot of financial theory and Wall Street wisdom and I use that term loosely, I'm making imaginary quotes in the air, uh, it's just flat out wrong. So I think that in of itself is worth the uh, price of admission on that one, just to pimp. And now he is my buddy, truth be told, but um, good book, and you should read it, okay, right after you read Layman's. Okay, so avoid seasonality. Now, just real quick, I don't want to beat the dead horse too much, but you can see that we're having a little ebb and flow action in the portfolio. We've got a couple of shorts. Well, last week it looked a little bit better, but overall the shorts are making a little bit money. Better than poke in the eye or the shorts. Uh, we got one new long so far. No good, but it's a it's a uh, food-related stock. Um, I went after a more volatile food, thinking that maybe the more volatile food could uh, move enough to make life worthwhile. And then we've got a couple of leftover longs in here. And so far we've got one that's hit the profit target. Excuse me, two, now that I look at it, that hit the profit target. And we're still waiting on this one uranium stock to uh, work out. And then, as I said last week, the, the last closed out trades, six out of six worked. It won't always work this great. Okay. And then uh, one of those was a short that was also a profitable trade. So the last six trades that stopped out were all profitable. Um, that tells me that we were in some kind of trend, although we did have that one short there, which was contra trend. But so five out of six stocks were trending uh, in, on the long side. So obviously we had a trend. Now things are getting a little mixed in here. You got a couple of losses and you got a couple of longs that are still working. So it's kind of this ebb and flow. And then as of today, we're looking to put on two more shorts, okay? We had one short we were looking to put on for about three or four days. It didn't trigger. It started going straight back up. So what did we do? We didn't take it. We took it out of the possible mix, out of the setups for, for tomorrow, okay? 
and that came out, I think, yesterday or day before. So you let that ebb and flow control everything. That entries and stops, entries and stops, entries and stops is going to make that happen. And then before you go any further, okay, stops is a good defense. But what's even better than a good defense? A good offense. So make sure you're picking the best stocks going in to begin with, okay? A couple of random thoughts. Take things one day at a time. Let the market come to you. Like I said uh, from um, – um, the book I was recently interviewed in, uh, Eddie Z's book. Uh, the market is not going out of business. One of the guys in there was interviewed said that, which I thought was great. And that's what he tells his new guys when they come along. Um, they're not going to make it easy on us. It's not going to be a route. Um, and I think, is this supposed to have an E on it? I'm not sure. I think it, it's not supposed to have an E. But anyway, they're not going to make it easy on us. And meaning that you come in this morning, and you're thinking, okay, it looks like it's, it just doesn't look good here. I looked at all my charts, like Dave said, and look a little iffy. What happens if the market starts going straight up, okay? And then it's like, right, when you start thinking, oh, maybe it's going to go straight up, turns around, goes straight down, and then, of course, then it starts going back up again. So be careful not to chase your own tail, okay? Um, Albert, there's a, there should be a lot more shares uh, that um, – Albert's asking me a question about something that's on the service. Uh, yeah, that's not many. There should be. I, I check with. There's another broker out there that has a couple of million shares. So uh, you might need to check around. But that is one of the problems on the short side. Sometimes it's hard to uh, to get shares. There are some mechanics involved. Uh, you want to play a good a good offense in 2014. And, this, and I've left this in since the beginning of the year. Uh, and just be very very selective. Like I've been saying quite a bit. I'm really making a conscious effort to pick the best of the best. Not that I haven't always done that, but I'm really questioning myself every time I go after a stock this year to make sure it's the best of the best. They call that deliberate practice. Uh, just just strive to get better and better and better at your stock picking. And again, the pressure's off. Okay, uh, it sure looks like this switch could be flipped, but let's not focus on the fact that. It's a bull market or a bear market. Let's just focus on things on a setup by setup basis until the overall market becomes a little bit more obvious. And as I've been beating the dead horse all year, once you find the best of the best stocks, then plan your trade and trade your plan. I know it's cliche, but I bet that quite a few of you here don't do that. Don't actually plan your trade ahead of time. Okay. A couple things real quick, and then we'll hop into the charts. So if you guys, I'm going to look at sectors and the overall market. Um, but if you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, feel free to start asking now. Um, just FYI, as I've been preaching, trade the best and lead the rest. I did a stock selection webinar back uh, last December. And uh, if you get the webinar, which was six hours plus seven hours of follow-up or Six hours plus eight hours of follow-up. I forget. Fourteen total. Okay, you'll get a year of my trading service for free. And these are the actual stocks. Uh, just just by looking, uh, no, no money management, no entries, no anything, other than where um, the day I recommended them, and then the, the moves that they made afterwards. And there's quite a few more down here. And you can go to the website and see those. I'll show you where that is real quick. And I think you'll be impressed. There were some pretty big moves. There, but if you just go to my website and click right here, I'm really proud of this stock selection webinar. I, and and you, you probably think, well, you're probably proud of everything. No, sometimes you do some things and you don't, you're not really sure with how they came out. This is something I was really proud of, and I found myself getting excited and talking fast when I was giving the presentation. I had to slow myself down because I was so excited because it's just good stuff, if I say so myself. And the feedback's been really good on that. But you can go to the website and take a look at the spreadsheet down here on the moves that um, were made a couple of months uh, after that. Now, let's take a look at, uh, let's get rid of the slides. Yeah, a couple of more announcements, and then we're, we're done. Um, yeah, keep those stock questions coming. We're going to have plenty of time today to get to all of that. Come on. Talk amongst yourselves. Here we go. OK, a um, couple of announcements. Um, I do have uh, volume two from 2013 of the weekly charts available now, and I dropped the price on that uh, for those who are interested. Um, so check that out. It's on my website. 
or actually, you know what I did? I, I combined the whole year. So it's now half the price of what it normally would be. So just see my website for that. My first two books are still relevant, and I, I often talk about patterns out of them, like we talked about bow ties a few minutes ago. Those were in the, also in my first two books, so check them out. And then, again, join my YouTube channel if you haven't already done so. And then, of course, uh, I do have a trading service, FYI. It's funny, you know, it's like I feel like I pimped this thing maybe too much, and then people email me. It's like, uh, could you give me some more specific advice? It's like, uh, do you do that? And I'm like, yes, I do. That's what the trading service is. That's that portfolio we talk about almost every week in here. All right, let's take a look at the overall market real quick. And you kind of have an idea where the sectors are, but I'm going to rehash that real quick. And then we're going to uh, hop into your individual questions and your stock picks. So we'll just keep uh, keep those coming, okay? All right, let's take a look at these P's. Well, as we are right now, we are not that far from all-time highs. Look at that, less than a half a percent. We started this presentation, it was a little bit more than a half percent. Now we're within, we're within a spitting distance of those brand new highs, okay? So as far as the S&P is concerned, draw your big blue arrow. In this case, I guess it's green now. And you'll see that trend looks pretty good, okay? But just be careful because just because this index says all is great in the world, we just showed, okay, not empirically, but I have to sneeze, but it won't come out. <laughs> uh, as we just showed, not only empirically, but through statistics, that uh, most of the stocks actually aren't trending uh, in the overall market and within the S&P itself, which is just off of these all-time highs. So that's kind of fascinating to me. Let's take a look at um, the rest, or, or not the rest, but a few other sectors in here in the overall market for that matter. Uh, take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ had a bit of an open gap reversal today, but it's it's come off its worst levels. Like I said, it's not going to be this perfect little route where it goes straight down, and we just get short and enjoy the ride along the way. There's going to be a lot of fits. It starts along the way. Okay. By the way, I don't want to digress too far, but uh, we're short Gilead. Because I was just looking at that open gap reversal in the NASDAQ. See a nice little open gap reversal. By the way, look at that. Uh, look how beautiful that is. That little open gap reversal is, and see, we're going to talk about pattern for the second book now. This is a witch hat for those who keep it score, okay? And you had that pivot high back here. One of my favorite things to look for when you've got a bit of a downtrend developing like this and you get this witch hat, look for an open gap reversal at or around that witch hat, even better if it comes up way up here. And then usually that kind of fakes out everyone, and then the market then kind of implodes from there. So now it's looking a little questionable. Let's go back to Gilead just for a second. Uh, Gilead, because Gilead did an opening gap reversal yesterday. There was good news yesterday on this stock. We are short, and we are losing money on it, admittedly. But so what? Let everything pan out. I know, easier said than done. Um but I ignore all earnings. I get this question over and over and over again, and I'll tell you this. I ignore all news. Let me repeat. I ignore all news. And then tomorrow I'm going to get a question. Dave, oh, what about the earnings? What about them? Who cares? Okay. I was just talking about Greg a minute ago with his book. And he's got, uh, and I've seen him speak several times where he pulls up the graphic. He pulls up a a market. I'm not even sure what it is. It might be the S&P 500, but it, I don't. I'm not sure what what stock or market it is. And there were like um, there was Katrina, there was a Gulf War, there was a uh, maybe another Gulf War. There were like 20 something earning periods. It's like all of these news events happen, and there's no way in the world you can go in this chart and pick them out. So it's irrelevant. Okay. Now talk out of both sides of my mouth, my favorite thing is when you have good news and the market acts opposite of that good news. In fact, that will actually test out. It's called a news reversal. And there's different ways of doing it. You can play it intraday. Notice that nice little open gap reversal that happened yesterday at Gilead, okay? 
or you can wait till it takes out that close and then short the market then, okay? But I don't necessarily play those directly unless you have a bigger picture set up, like in this particular case, kind of a witch hat looking pattern. And notice that it did an opening gap reversal right at those prior highs, okay? I just paid for your webinar, okay? I hope you paid attention to that. Write that down. Witch hat, opening gap reversal, reversing at the prior highs. Let's take a look at the rusty. Rusty kind of looks like the NASDAQ, not quite as ominous as the NASDAQ, but you can see thrust down followed by a pullback. Let's draw that in. And when in doubt, what do we do? Take the chart out. Okay. So that looks like a market in a downtrend that has just pulled back. I'm not, uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that or to see that. Okay. Um, everybody knows that. Well, did you know that Pinocchio was a bad motivational speaker? I see potential in you and you. <laughs> I digress. Sorry about that. Um, chemicals. Not too far from these brand new highs, all-time highs, and then pfft, beginning to kind of implode a little bit today in here. And that's just the kind of market we're in. Now, here's your energies. One thing that concerns me about these energies is they're just they just have this slight little drift as of late. When a market corrects, I like to see a market correct by doing that. I don't like to see this upward drift because usually when you see this upward drift, usually the mother of all corrections is coming. I wouldn't say rush out and short. Energies, it's not a tradable pattern, but it's a pattern I've observed where you get these slight little upward drifts and then the market uh, implodes from that. So that's got to be a little bit concerned. Now, the other thing is, uh, as I said earlier, is what if, um, Don's ready for a no, uh, what if, <laughs> that'll make sense in a minute, What's going to happen when these energies begin to correct and these other markets that are defying gravity begin to correct? Uh, it's going to, is it going to have an impact on the overall market? Excuse me. Is it going to have an impact on the overall market? And the answer is yes, it will. And will that selling be getting more selling? I don't know, but it could. Uh, a couple other areas, aluminum kind of hovering around their old highs in here. Uh, for the most part, defensive-related issues, foods, tobaccos, utilities, at or near these new highs in here and longer-term uptrends, just nothing to get too excited about. Take a look at drugs. Take a look at biotech, okay? All of these areas that are tech, or most, I should say, not all. I want to make a blanket statement, blanket statement. For the most part, you know, when in doubt, take the chart out. And now you're kind of like, what do you have here? You know, like ABC or 1, 2, 3, whatever you want to call it. I'm not going to say count waves. It's a good way. You can wave through your money as it goes by if you're counting waves. But um, but you can see thrust down, pull back. It looks like we're going to do, I don't want to use the word wave, but new leg down in biotech, okay? Uh, some of these areas like health services were just recently at these brand new highs and now begun to break down, and now they're all the way down towards the bottom of their range. So that's a little bit concerning. Um you know, you got some areas like railroads breaking out to new highs, but if you dig within the sector or there's some stocks that are sector-related here that aren't doing so hot. So I find that interesting that we have this big dichotomy out there. And if you guys have been around me for a long, long time, if everything is rosy, I'm going to be the most excited guy in the excited guy town, right? Okay? But when things get a little iffy, I'm going to kind of pick it apart a little bit. And so I'm not going to take things on face value, and I think that's the, the whole part the whole point of today's lecture is don't take things on face value. Make sure you do dig a little deeper. And for me, I just do that in empirical research. In other words, I'm just looking at so many charts every day that it tells me, hey, wait a minute, all isn't great in the world in spite of what some sector or even an, a big index like the S&P 500 will tell you. Okay. Um, REITs also doing pretty good in here, just kind of hanging out, hanging out. I can't get that excited about REITs. Look at the HV10. That's kind of boring. I want to make a big yawn on that, okay? But if it's all we left to trade, then maybe we might just trade them. We'll see. We'll take things on a setup-by-setup -setup basis. I think that's enough. I think I kind of beat the dead horse on what's going on. The other thing is uh, financials have been doing uh, fairly poorly in here, too, uh, as, a, as a standout, I should say. And you can see they've kind of made a thrust down and pull back a little bit 
if you are going to look at financials, uh, don't look at the financials within TC uh, on uh, the financial media general group or what do they call now, Morningstar group now. And the reason is that sector has a big bond component to it, which might, which which will actually go up in questionable conditions. But overall, financials are looking pretty um, iffy. All right, let's open it up for general questions, any questions, and individual stocks. Jonathan has an interesting question: Why is GDXJ so much stronger than GLD? Well, first of all, the quick answer is our old friend historical volatility. Let's take a look at GLD. GLD has a HV of 14. This is the underlying commodity. Now GDXJ is going to be the gold mine of juniors. GDXJ. Okay. Look at the HV here. 53. Okay. So what was gold? I forget. 14 and then GDXJ is 53. So it's about four times more volatile, okay? Now, what are these? These are junior gold miners. These are the lower-tiered gold stocks, okay? Not not gold the commodity, but gold stocks. Um, to those of you on the service and maybe even in these weekly webinars, we were talking about back here. We had bow ties and such where they bottomed out, and they looked pretty interesting. But since then, they have rolled back over. So the question is, why are they stronger than gold? Well, they're a lot more volatile than gold. These are like these small little companies. Gold itself is a very efficient market, okay? It tends to trade. It doesn't, it, when it trends, it does trend, but it doesn't trend that often like most other commodities, okay? When it trends, it's fantastic. It's wonderful. But it does tend to chop around a lot because you've got, a lot of players in there. You've got the, the people that are digging it up that might need a hedge in the market. You got people that are trying to speculate. You got one lotters. You got a whole bunch of people in there. People might need to buy gold and make jewelry. People might need it for manufacturing purposes. So commodities tend to be really efficient. If you have time, go in and watch the free video I did on. Uh, it's kind of a pimp to this. I'm sort of pimping this stock webinar, but there's a lot of good information there if I say so myself. Go right here, click on free videos, and then watch the video I did that introduces the stock webinar. It's on one of these right here, number two, the second one here, an introduction to stock selection. Watch that one because I talked a lot about inefficiency in that, which is very important to understand. So that's why, because the gold miners are very much more or very more inefficient than the underlying commodity. Okay? And hopefully that made sense. Thanks, Dave. Thoughts of the metals. Heads of screaming. 1,000 gold. Well, let's take a look at that. How many times do I have to tell you? Don't call me doing my show. Um, well, where would 1,000 gold put you? Back towards the old lows? That's yeah, plausible. You know, here's the thing, and if you go in and watch that, that uh, YouTube video, I talk about the significance of bow ties when they occur at low levels is more significant than when they occur at, at um, uh, let's say, major lows versus when it's not a major low, and then major highs versus when it's not a major high. So this bow tie right here, was the mother of all major bow ties for gold and notice that the peak prior to that was never exceeded okay so this bow tie here as I said in my columns could have been the mother of all bottoms and so far it hasn't gotten taken out yet so it's still in place but you do have a minor sell signal that's happened since then right here and I'm not gonna rush out and buy gold we have one leftover gold stock as you just saw in G okay in the portfolio and if it stops out it stops out it should stop out at a loss okay god forbid opening gaps but it should should be the keyword that said it stop out did i say a loss it should stop out at a gain okay it should stop out at a gain um unless something really bad happens okay but i don't see any reason to go long go yeah it certainly could come back here it tests this prior lows for sure but i wouldn't 
shorted at this juncture based on the signal because where is it going to go? It's probably going to come down here and find some support. So from here to here, it's not worth a trade for me. I like to set myself up where I have clear clear air ahead, blue sky ahead, to where a market could rally without hitting that overhead supply along the way. Okay, or in this case, support. Phil wants to talk about Joe. Joe's been really strong lately. Um. And Joe is coffee, okay? And uh, Big Dave likes coffee. Put a lot of caffeine in this body. <laughs> I'm going to put a little bit more right now. It looks pretty good. Um, it's going to have to break out to new highs, though, decisively, and then pull back before it be set up again. So it's going to have to rally up like this and then pull back a little bit. Um as I said a few minutes ago, if the overall market gets choppy, then maybe we'll look to these commodities and any other areas that are trending um, and play those areas while the market finds its way. Okay. LRCX for a long for Luz. LRCX. Um, let me get my chart fixed here. Uh, no, because there's no structure there for me, okay? Uh, this stock is just all over the place, okay? It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down a lot. It goes straight back up, went straight back down. So I don't know why you would buy it just because it's going up at the moment. Um, now, if it keeps going up and then it pulls back and you got a pretty serious trend, okay, then... Um, then you go with it. Assuming coffee price is the reason JVA got hit. Yeah, I'm not sure what the correlation between coffee and JVA is. Um, JVA is when we're long. This is more volatile. Longer term, it's kind of all over the place. But I did like the way it set up in here. It pulled back. and just began to take off. And it was pretty volatile for a food company. So I thought it was worth a shot with uh, coffee doing so well. Um, but then it's kind of lost a little steam. WRES for Jonathan, is that right? That's going to be an energy company, I think. Let's see if I can get the um, window over here. Bear with me one second. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's making new highs. It looks pretty good. I think this is on my momentum list, if memory serves, because it's banging out new highs. Let's check real quick. Yeah, right here. See, it's it's on my list. Okay, this is the Landry 100. You'll notice that most of the stocks in here, I'm not too worried if I overweight in one area because these are not real dollars. I would rather have it just tell me overwhelmingly that where where the money is flowing as opposed to putting real dollars to this to, to all 100 of these stocks and that's the beauty of tracking this uh, momentum list in here and you can see energy 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 food stock food stock food stock energy 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 um, energy utilities okay uh, so it tells you where the money is and where the money is flowing based on the momentum list so that WRES would have to Continue to break out and then pull back. That doesn't mean that I'm not going to keep it's it's meeting all the qualifications to be in a momentum list because it's doing what? It's making new high. Okay, that's all it has to do. Okay, Don's here and he would like to know about Ford. Ford is actually okay, I guess, as far as if you look at it, if you look at it, I think it's an uptrend proper order. Yep, um, at least lately it's kind of going up, but for the most part it's kind of all over the place and it's got a lot of overhead supply. So uh, I'm going to whip out Nicholas and say, no. <laughs> Nicholas is quiet today. Normally he's a little bit more adamant. We'll find another one for him. GTAT. All right, let's take a look at GTAT. Ah, uh, not bad. Not bad for Don, at least. Uh, a little sideways, though, as of late, so I would leave it alone based on that. 
uh, to get excited about this stock and have the breakout and then pull back. Now, this is another case where if you're long, stay long, okay? Uh, it's in an uptrend, and so far, so good. Now, as I pick it apart more and more, though, I do see that it made a marginal new high. It kind of sold off a little bit. It's pulled back a little. I wouldn't trade this pattern, but it's starting to look like a bit of a micro first thrust. Just residues. Let's put the bow tie moving averages in and see what they say. No, not quite a bow tie just yet. But, yeah, I would leave that one alone. Okay. All right. Big Al says, I entered unit. Well, I don't know if you're Big Al. I'm thinking of a, there's a Big Al in New Orleans. He makes Bloody Marys. I'm not a big Bloody Mary fan, but he makes the really good ones. Um, where's he at? Marina Grill? Anybody ever go to Marina Grill and get a Big Al? Big Al is this big, huge dude makes these Bloody Marys. He looks like the guy, um, God rest his soul, the guy from um, Green Mile. Anyway, I digressed. Uh, all right, Albert wants to know about UNT. He said he entered it at 62 with $2 risk. Mm, okay. Uh, hit the private target rate, stop to break even. Your opinion on the trade? Curious as to why you passed it on the service. Well, the reason I passed it on the service was because, I don't know which 62 you, you entered at, but if you look at this last little drop here, it dropped all the way back to where it was right here. Okay, so I don't usually go after stock after it drops back below its prior levels. Also, you can see it accelerated here, and now, depends on how you want to look at it, it has lost acceleration. So even though it's making new highs, it's kind of lost acceleration. Now it's trying to pick it up again. So just the fact that on a net-net basis, it really didn't go anywhere for about a month and a half, or at least a month, is why I didn't um, go after it. But, hey, if you're long, you know, it's not my way or the highway. And I will tell you this, I do get really picky sometimes with stocks, okay? Um, but it didn't jump out at me as a, vi at, as a viable setup. And even back here, even though it had this run-up, this is not a deep enough pullback based on this run-up, okay? It's a nice little, nice little run-up out of a base, don't get me wrong. But I need a little bit more knockout because if you buy in a shallow pullback, Depends on the market now. If you're in a rip roaring bull market, just buy anytime. You don't even have to worry about a shallow pullback. But if you buy in a shallow pullback and you're not in a rip roaring bull market, then there's a good chance that that correction has not completed. But hey, if you're still long, I would stay long. I'd let that stop loose it up just a little bit. Uh, you started off at two points, maybe give it three points now, and then let that uh, widen out a little bit more. And, and, and congratulations, you might you might be riding out a longer term trend here. Okay. So uh, kudos to you. But that's why, I, in case you're wondering why I passed on the service, that's why. Okay. TSO? Okay. No. No. All right, here's the deal. All right, Don, I'm going to beat you up again. Don, you just, you're not, you, you just come here to get beat up, right? Let's whip out Nicholas. No. Okay. What are energies doing? Well, there's an energy. What's it doing? There's an energy. Okay, there's an energy, <laughs> you know, what are these energies doing? There's another energy. Let's look at energies overall, okay? If I could find my list, let's go look at energies overall. And we're going to draw an arrow on energies. I don't want to be a jerk here or anything, but come on, let's. Don, you could do better. All right, let me find energies. Talk amongst yourselves. Oh, here we go. All right, let's draw an arrow on energies. So, is it safe to say that energies have been going higher? I think so. Let's take a look at GTAT. Oh, I'm sorry, not GTAT. What was it, FTAT? Now I lost my way. What was the stock, Don? <laughs> anyway, that energy stock that Don was just talking about, whatever the case, whatever that was, let's see if I can find it by going backwards. Oh, there it is. Okay. It's doing this. Pick a random energy stock. Well, these are in Landry 100, so we know they're trendy, but there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. There's another one. Okay. There's one down here, way down here. What are all these stocks doing? They're going up. Draw your arrows. Okay. If you ever lose your way. Send me a self-addressed self stamped envelope. 
to P.O. Box 298, Vita Springs, Louisiana, 70420, and I will send you this business card. On the back of this business card is your patented trend follower, okay? So you hold it up to your screen, and you look at markets to see which way they're headed. This one looks like it's in an uptrend. That's an energy. That's an energy, okay? That's an energy. That's an energy. That's an energy, okay? They're all headed higher. So if you're going to trade an energy stock, which way should it be trading? Should it be going up? Should it be going down? Should it be going sideways, okay? Amazon, AMZN. Amazon's in a downtrend. Bam, there you go. Amazon's a little bit of an efficient stock. It's high price. It's thick. It's volatile. It's not that volatile, I should say, but it's um, it's choppy. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, I If you want to short that, I think you could short that. It's got a lot of support back here, and then it's going to be a choppy ride down. It's going to catch a little support here. It's going to catch a little support all the way down. This is why you're not seeing this on my Landry list, in case you're wondering, okay? But, yeah, it certainly caught my eye last night when I was doing my scans. It's certainly been catching my eye lately. Um, if you want to trade it, absolutely. It looks like it's headed lower. I just think that there's some stocks that might implode a little bit faster than Amazon. And then I also think that your gains are going to be limited, okay? I prefer something that has a little bit clearer air, something that might look like this, okay? And maybe has some support way back here. So when it drops, it's to go all the way down to that prior support as opposed to finding a little support along the way. But good eye on Amazon, A R A R I A. <laughs> Don, no. Have we not learned anything? <laughs> It's going completely sideways. It's got a big old gap down. Looks like it got that drawn in from weeks prior. IRE. I'm not going to like IRE. IRE is roll back over. This is, um, I once said I had a love-hate relationship with this company, and Doug Newberry said, you love it, and it hates your account. <laughs> and it does. Uh, yeah, it looks like a possible short, but it's going to have a lot of support back here around 15 so I would leave it alone. I don't think it's worth a good eye, by the way, but I don't think it's worth shorting just for a, a pop down to 15. But if you're happy with a swing trade, knock yourself out on that one. R-O-S-G, that sounds like either a energy or a biotech, and it's a biotech. Yeah, it looks like a short. It's less than $5 a share, kind of hard to short those. Um, uh, it just looks like it's in trouble, but I don't see any way that's tradable. AKOB for John. AKOB. AKOB. Bottoming. Uh, yeah, sure. Now, here's the deal. Uh, first of all, super, super, super duper thin stock. So be very careful with that, okay? Uh, the other thing, too, is most of these stocks are in longer-term uptrends. Um, I don't know. I need to think twice about whether or not I want to kind of bottom fish here. But I hear you. I can't really argue with this. It's got a double bottom that's lower. This is kind of a textbook kind of study on this stock because take a look at – notice how that this bottom kind of took out the prior bottom, and that's a really good fake-out type of pattern. And then, of course, you got the bow tie off of these major lows in here. So I would almost give you a high five if it wasn't so thin. And the only other thing is, um, I don't know if you want to be trying to play transitions in the um, food and beverages at this juncture because they've been going up for so long. If anything, it's almost like you want to wait for them to roll over and then uh, have a little shorting action there. But, yeah, John, by all means, it is bottoming, so good eye on that one. Just super duper thin. A-F-O-P. A-F-O-P for Mr. Phil. How are things across the pond this morning, Phil? Uh, it's a little wide and loose. It's an electronics or semiconductor, so that's – I'd leave it alone. It's also kind of making a reversal at mid-levels. Um, I'd leave it alone. It's sunny. Wow, it's never sunny over there. OAS. I don't think I could live with all that doom and gloom and overhead and rain. Yuck. Um, this one looks okay if you zoom in on it, but, hey, you know – 
these energy stocks are going straight up in here. I don't. I think you can find better. Uh, yeah, I hear you. It's bottomed out, but it's bottomed out, bottomed out at mid levels. Okay. Yeah, I hear you, Fred. Uh, I hear you, but uh, on the one month chart. Yeah, I don't look that. I usually don't look at monthly charts unless we're looking at indices or something. Uh, I hear you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, it's kind of rallying on the mon monthly chart. Let's take a little weekly. It looks like it's kind of turning on the weekly too. Um, I mean, it looks okay shorter term. I just think you you could find better out there in the energies at this juncture. Okay, rice. I like. I like rice. Um, rice is a recent IPO, and it's done really well. And some of the IPO research that I've done in more recent times, and actually it's a continuation from stuff I started about five years ago. It's taken me that long to finish my research, <laughs> and I still have a lot more to do. But um, Rice is an actual uh, case study that I've been following. Um, I think an IPO, I'm not a big breakout player, but in IPOs, I think there's a breakout characteristic to them. And we talked a lot about that in the stock selection webinar. In fact, Rice may have come up in one of these sessions. Um, I wouldn't buy it right now, but I'd wait for a pullback and I'd be all over it. Okay, absolutely. When slow move to fill a gap at seventy for Richard STZ STZ. Um, yeah, now see, I'd be more interested in shorting a food stock. I don't like this gap here. You're right. I don't like the gap. If the stock didn't have this gap back here, I would say that it could be a possible. Short. It's also got this wide range bar here, so it's kind of a little erratic. I think it would pass based on that kind of action on that one. A U M N. A U M N. Uh, no, that's that's roll back over. It looks like it wants to go back to its old lows. Okay. Um. Yeah, leave that one alone. There's nothing to do there. Okay. Why our C W is going to be a Shipping company, YRCW. Uh, no, it's trucking. It looks like it's rolled back over. Uh, if you get a short, short back here, as I have illustrated. Okay, A and R. That's going to be another goal, isn't it? Yeah, it's nothing to do with this one. I mean, um, draw your arrow. So far, it looks like it's headed lower. So, yeah, leave that alone. TSO is a... If crude is higher, the margin shrink. Oh, TSO is a refiner. If crude is higher, the margin shrink. Oh, very good. Of course, Karen is confusing the issue with facts. <laughs> but good point. Great point, Karen. Uh, she's saying that uh, if crude goes higher, the margins actually shrink when you go when you go to crack the crude. Okay. Good point. Good point. Smart bunch. RDNT. RDNT. All right, look at that. Sounds like a tiny Elvis stock. Look at it. Look at that stock. It's huge. My only problem here is it's gone straight up. But Dave, I thought you liked momentum. I do, I do. But in this particular case, it's went from way down here. It's went up about five hundred percent over a short period of time. Maybe on a pullback, but it had to be a deep pullback. Uh, I'd be really careful. I think this is actually one of my momentum lists. I'm pretty sure it is. Oh, there it is, right there. See, it's in the Landry 100. But I would leave it alone as far as an individual stock. Remember, there's two different. The Landry 100 is just a list of momentum stocks that I track. I don't necessarily trade each and every one of them. But uh, I hear you. It's going up. Uh, maybe on a pullback, but it's just the magnitude of that rally is pretty ridiculous. Okay. Hi, Dave. What volume range do you look at when you flip the charts? Thanks. When? Uh, when? Uh, those are 250,000 shares or more for the average uh, stock. Okay, Dave, what are your thoughts on the metals? Uh, talking heads. Is, okay, we got that one. Uh, please check uh, EXCAG. Okay, please check CAG. Um, CAG is another one of those energies, and most of those energies are just going straight up as of late. And on a pullback, it might be worthwhile. It's at a little bit lower levels, but it's okay. It's making three or four year highs in here. I think it's okay. And look, hey, it's in my list right there. There it is. X steel. Okay. Let's take a look at that. Phoenix stock. Um yeah, my problem with the US steel is it's just such a big thick stock. It seems like it's always hard for it to get gone. Um it would have to get 
above, let's say, 33 and change, maybe about 35. Then it's going to have some bad memories along the way. Maybe find a smaller steel company to trade. UEC, is that, a, is that uranium? Yeah, it's uranium. Um, it's headed lower. I mean, what are you going to do, draw an arrow? Yeah, you want to leave that alone. And then it's going to have bad memories when it tries to rally out of that, okay? And, you know, but Davey Long, URG, well, we're long until we get stopped out or until we hit the profit target and trail will stop higher. So as long as it moves in our favor, we're going to stick with it. That's how we roll. EBR. EBR. Ooh, that looks good. Looks pretty good. Uh, good volume. Um, yeah, not too extreme of a trend, but a good trend. Uh, on a pullback, though, possibly. So good eye on that one. Glog. G-L-O-G. G-L-O-G. That's going to be a shipper, I think. Yeah, it's a shipping company. Yeah, it's done really well. It needs a little bit more of a knockout move in here. So I would pass unless it made new highs and then had a bit of a knockout move. One thing I've found with the shippers, you got to be real selective with shippers, is shippers tend to be choppy. Shipping and educational stuff is two of my least favorite areas out there, okay? <laughs> what are you saying? I'm, I'm using some language in here. DYN is accelerating upwards. Well, let's take a look at that. That's going to be, guess what, an energy... Okay. Oh, electric utility, close. But it sounds like an energy, doesn't it? Dynergy. Uh, yeah, it looks okay. It's accelerating upwards, maybe on a knockout move. It's got to pull back. But, yeah, I hear you. Um, that'll probably make uh, my momentum list at some point in time. RDNT would add to when pullback day like continue strong closes. RDNT. Yeah, RDNT is going straight up, I think, if I'm thinking of the right stock. But it just needs a it needs a knockout move, and like I just said earlier, it's just so uh, extended in here. AMDA IPO former setup at never triggered AMDA AMDA. Um, yeah, it would have triggered back here somewhere, and then it ran up. Hopefully, it ran up enough to get an initial profit target, but then it came back in. Uh, what was the question on that one, Fred? No, it would have triggered because um, it triggered, now it's kind of thin now, but it would have triggered somewhere in here. I think we did follow it in the service, and we took it off because it went too many days without triggering. But for argument's sake, I mean, if you want to say that it did sort of trigger it to pull back, took off, then came right back in. Okay, you want to leave that one alone now, though. AXAS, we talk about that one? That's going to be an oil company. Ooh, that looks pretty good. A little bit needs a little bit more pullback though. Okay, needs a little bit like that pullback, like right there. I'd be all over that. It's not bad. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, but it needs a pullback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's no setup for now. Too late. Yeah, and Fred, if memory serves, that one was one that was on the service. If you, if you, I don't know if you're looking at the archives of the service or not, but if you go to the service page, you scroll down to the archives. Um, that one, I think, was on the radar for a while, and then we took it off after it didn't trigger. So, yeah, it didn't trigger, but, I mean, technically, it, it, a pullback did trigger on it, but we took it off the list, if that's what you're asking. XLF, XLI, XLK, all sideways. These are aggressive sectors. XLF. Well, that's more like a short. I would call that a short. you got a bow tie down and a deep retracement. Sideways longer term. Shorter term, bow tie down. Okay, XLI, sideways. Yeah, that's kind of sideways. I agree. And XLK um, is sideways. But technology, let's take a look at the Qs. Let's look at it like inverse Qs and things like that. A um, little choppy, but you can see the Qs themselves, pretty serious slide and so forth. We'll only retrace that. When in doubt, take the chart. What? Out. Okay. And you see you got a thrust down followed by a pullback. Okay, Netflix for Zymeo. I'm hoping hope I'll get that right. Zymeo Chong. Did I get it right? ZM. That's what you normally go by, right? NFLX. I recognize the ZM. 
Um, I don't like the way it gapped higher in here, but I hear you. It certainly it looks like it's in a lot of trouble. I don't like the gap, though. Now, that might be me just looking for perfection, but, yeah, it's in a lot of trouble. Um, 200 could probably be the next stop on that one. I'm just kind of a perfectionist. I don't like the gaps against the trend, but I hear you. I think it's in trouble, ZM. Uh, Alvin says he wants to win. Well, I want to win, too, Alvin. You're a winner. You're a winner, and I'm a winner. We're all winners. Oh, win, W-I-N. Oh, okay. <laughs> Channeling Pinocchio there. Uh, too wide and loose longer term. It's going to have too much uh, overhead supply longer term. So I would leave that one alone. Okay. ACXM from Mr. Matt. Matt, are you up in, is that Northern Matt or Southern Matt? Hey, I got a Matt in Canada. And I got a Matt in the States. I always get you too confused. Um... This looks okay. In fact, this is high five worthy. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Um, yeah, I like the way it faked out today and all. High five. That's a stock that's in a lot of trouble. Big picture double top, thrust down, not a whole lot of support for a while. Hey, you got a little support back here. Not too bad, though. Be a good problem to have. Yeah, high five. Good eye. Who gave me that one? Matt? Okay, it's Southern Matt. Southern Matt, give me that one. Okay. Okay, when wants to know what do you qualify as a pullback? What percentage? It all depends on the volatility of the stock. Okay. So, and it all depends on like the prior trend. If the stock is in a pretty serious uptrend, goes straight up like that, you want a deep pullback to shake out as many people as possible. Okay. So, it depends on the volatility of the stock. And there's no really quick answer on that. It depends. Okay. Damn those Geico commercials. I know. You can't get them out of your head. <laughs> uh, entered ACXM this morning thinking it was a big picture double top with first thrust, which had down. What do you think? ACXM. Oh, you already entered it. Yeah, I like it. Good job. What's your plan? Follow your plan. Okay. Gilead? Gilead I like. Don, Gilead's in trouble. For once, Don and I agree. Look at that. Yeah, I think Gilead's in trouble as a possible short. I think it's still viable short. It's, it's, it's choppy, though. It's been a bumpy ride on that one. Uh, but, yeah, I think it's still in a lot of trouble. F-E-Y-E. F-E-Y-E. -E. Stops work was long over 30 points ago, the gap, and your bow ties were in, were key in hindsight. Uh, let's see. Bow ties. Wow, look at that. It both tied right back here. That's kind of cool. That's pretty awesome that this stock actually, it looks abysmal back here and it actually bow tied. That's kind of cool. And then sort of a bow tie down, but when you get a big gap down like this and the market begins to really implode, uh, the bow tie becomes kind of forced. So I, I don't really count that as a, as a bow tie down. I mean, it is, but it's, it's kind of a forced bow tie. I call it more like a reversal gap strategy or a first thrust or something like that. How about man H? Man H. Sounds like mayonnaise. Uh, man H. Yeah, I think this is a stock that's in trouble. Um, this this is kind of an extreme move higher. I just said you want a deep pullback, but that's the one bar nature of it. But um, I'm going to say that looks okay, ZM. I think it's uh, I think it's a stock that's in trouble. So I'm give you a good eye on that one. Okay. F-Tech? Don't make me whip out Nicholas. No. <laughs> uh, it's kind of all over the place, Don. Um, I see it's kind of bottoming in here, but it's got a big gap down. Looks like we talked about that one last week. Okay, any more? we got time for just a couple of more in here. Dave, any thoughts? Why the market activity is so lethargic? Well, I don't try to outsmart the market. I don't try to figure out the market. I don't try to figure out the whys. We're going to know the whys at some point. But trying to incorporate the whys into your active trading is usually an exercise in futility and doesn't really work. Okay? Uh, why is the market so lethargic? Yet today in the journal, 
was an article that Ameritrade's volume rocketed recently makes no sense. Um, I don't know. Um, is high frequency trading kind of keeping the market within a range? Um, is the Fed throwing a little gas on the market here when it's uh, whenever the S and P's roll over a little bit? Are uh, you know, the P's being propped up by someone who has more money than you and I and is able to keep the market as opposed uh, basis the P's propped up? I don't know, and and maybe we'll find out after the fact. But for now. What you do is you play the hand that's dealt. You put on a couple of shorts because there's some good-looking shorts out there. You might want to buy energy or two as they begin to pull back and set up and you get entries, okay? And, of course, honor your stops on existing positions and wait for entries on any new ones. So, yeah, who knows? Who knows why the market is doing what it's doing? And we'll find out after the fact. So it's not, a, it's not something you could trade off of. Apple? Uh, Apple's just too all over the place. I'm not sure that's a sentence. Two all over the place. Um, it gapped down and then it chopped and chopped and chopped and chopped. And now it's popping up here. Okay, so there's no structure here. What's my structure? Thrust followed by a pullback. Okay, that's pretty much it. You know, or maybe some transitional micro thrust followed by a little bit of a pullback. Okay, micro pullback. Uh, somebody was asking earlier depth of pullback. If you're trading a transitional setup, then you might just have a tiny little pullback. If you're trading a longer term uptrend. Like something like an energies, you want a deeper pullback, okay? A C X M A C X M. The question is three point stop. Does that seem wide enough? Wanted to get above which had highs. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is a fairly volatile stock, not super volatile, but three points, yeah. I mean, you're up here a little bit. Um that seems plausible to me. I don't see what your witch hat, you kind of micro witch hat in here. I don't see the, the big witch hat. Um, and you got to put a stop where you would obviously be wrong. I mean, believe it or not, it actually even go a little bit wider than three points to get you like a little bit further up here. Because that way, you know, it's like, you know, you're, you're definitely um, wrong. But uh, not bad. It's a little thin to be shorting, though. It's less than 500,000. As a general statement, less than 500,000 could be a little dangerous to short. Shorted at 30.73. How'd you get that, Phil? 30.73. I don't see when it went through that, unless it. Huh. Interesting. Okay. Well, look, we're a little bit over time, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming as usual. I, I'm flattered that you'd be here, uh, that you take time of your ske schedule to come here to, uh, and listen and watch me. So thank you so much for that. Uh, any unanswered questions, you know the routine, daviddavelander.com. Um, hopefully we'll see all you guys and girls uh, again next week. Thank you so much.